Hello students, welcome back. In previous chapters, we have learned about the classification of the plantae kingdom. Among the plants, the flowering ones come under the term angiosperms. In this video, let's explore the morphology of flowering plants. Since a young age, we have learned that the part of plant below the soil is the root system, while the part above the soil is the shoot system. Angiosperms that are the flowering plants are divided into two classes, dicotyledons and monocotyledons. Dicotyledons which have two embryonic leaves and monocotyledons which have only one embryonic leaf that is the cotyledon. The primary root or radical is the first organ that we can observe when a seed germinates. Let me draw a seed here. This is a seed and here this one is the radical and this one is the plumule. This radical develops into the root system and plumule develops into the shoot system. And when a seed germinates, the first organ that we can observe that is the radical. In dicotyledons, the radical directly elongates into the soil and forms the root system. This is the primary root which is the radical, the center one. This is the radical which elongates into the soil in case of dicotyledons. And from the primary root, secondary roots arises and from secondary root, tertiary roots arises. This primary, secondary and tertiary roots together known as the tap root system. This we can observe in mustard plants which is a dicotyledon. Thus we understood that dicotyledons have a tap root system. The first one the radical elongates into the soil that is the primary root. From that secondary and tertiary roots arises that is the tap root system in dicotyledons. Now let's understand the case of monocotyledons. Here the primary root in seeds is short lived. They withered off and replaced by a number of roots that arise from the base of the stem. This is known as fibrous root and we can see this in wheat plants. In dicotyledons the radical elongates that is the primary root from that secondary and tertiary roots arises. But in case of monocotyledons, the radical that withered off and a number of roots arises from the base of the stem. This is known as the fibrous root. Some plants have roots that develop from parts other than the radical. These are called adventitious roots. For example, the banyan tree reaches a height up to 30 meters and spreads laterally and indefinitely. Aerial roots, that means the roots we can see above the soil, that they grow from the tree's branches and reach the soil to give extra support to the tree. These adventitious roots in banyan tree are known as prop roots. Similarly, the adventitious roots in grass are known as crown roots. Crown roots are adventitious roots that are unique to grasses. They are present at the base of the stem close to the soil surface. That part, the base of the stem is known as the crown and the roots arises from the crown is known as crown root. The main functions of a root system. First, the absorption of water and minerals from the soil that we all know, providing anchorage to the plants, storing reserve food materials. Mainly, this food is reserved in the cortex region of the root. Carbohydrates are stored in this region. Synthesis of plant growth regulators. We have learned about plant growth regulators. For example, auxins and cytokinins are hormones which are examples of plant growth regulators. These auxins and cytokinins are synthesized in roots. Now let's learn about the regions of the root. The tip of the root is known as the root tip and this root tip is covered by a structure 
called root cap. This area that penetrates the soil and hence it should be strong. That is the function of root cap. It gives protection to the apex of the root while it penetrates the soil. A few millimeter above the root cap is the region of high meristematic activity. That is known as root apical meristem. Meristematic cells we know that they are responsible for the growth of the roots. The cell here are small, thin walled and with dense cytoplasm. They are small, thin walled and dense cytoplasm. These characteristics help those cells to divide rapidly and hence the root grows faster. Above the region of the meristematic cells is the region of elongation. The cells here undergo rapid elongation and are responsible for the length of the root. The cells in the region of elongation will gradually mature and that is why the zone above the elongation region is also known as the region of maturation. This area has mature cells that has been modified from elongation cells. From the region of maturation, some epidermal cells form a very delicate thread-like structures called the root hairs. These root hairs are responsible for the absorption of water and minerals from the soil. Let's recap the regions of a root. There is a root tip and this root tip is covered by a structure called the root cap. Then above that area is the root apical meristem. Above that is the region of elongation and some cells of the region of elongation will become mature and form the region of maturation. In the region of maturation, some epidermal cells form very delicate thread-like structures called the root hairs. The stem is a part above the soil that bears branches, leaves, flowers and fruits. We learned that the root develops from the radical of the germinating seed while the stem arises from the plumule of the germinating seed. This is the radical and this is the plumule, this area. Stem arises from the plumule and root arises from the radical. The leaves arise from the stem at the regions called the nodes. This is a node. From node, leaf arises. The area between two nodes, here there is one node and here there is another node. This area, this is known as the internode. The area between two nodes, that is the internode. Buds are also present on the stem. A terminal bud is present at the top of the stem. The axillary bud, this one is a bud. Here, there is another axillary bud. Here, another axillary bud. These axillary buds are produced at the nodes where the leaves grow from. When young, the stem is green, then it becomes woody and dark brown. Let's see the functions of stem. Spreading out branches bearing leaves, flowers and fruits. Stem conducts water and minerals. Stem performs photosynthesis as it bears leaves. Some store food like pineapple and potato. Stem provides support to the plant. It gives protection from wind and rain. This can be achieved due to the presence of cuticle which is formed of wax coated cells. Hence, it can give protection from rain. Stem helps in vegetative propagation. We know that when we cut the stem of some plants and plant it on soil, they induce root development and develop as a new plant. Hence, we can say that stem helps in vegetative propagation. Now, let's learn about the parts of stem. Leaves are lateral flattened structures born from the stem. We know that leaves arises from the buds on the nodes. Leaf also can arise from the apical meristem. At the tip of the stem, there are meristematic cells which are known as the apical meristematic cells. 
these cells are responsible for the growth of the stem and here from this apical meristematic cells a leaf can arise and these leaves are arranged in acropetal order there is a bud in the axil of the leaves which is known as the axillary bud or the lateral bud a new branch arises from the axillary bud a leaf has three main parts leaf base petiole and lamina a leaf is attached to the stem with the help of a leaf base this leaf base bears two lateral small leaf like structures called the stipules the function of stipules is to protect the lateral bud or axillary bud the green expanded part of the leaves with veins and veinlets is known as lamina or leaf blade the middle prominent vein this is known as the midrib these veins in the blade provide rigidity to the blade and they help to transport water and minerals and food materials to all the part of leaf the blade is held tight by a structure called petiole this is the petiole petioles are very thin and flexible and allow the leaf blade to flutter in the wind thereby cooling the blade and bringing fresh air to the surface of the leaves in monocotyledons the leaf base is not a stick like structure here this is a dicot leaf and this structure the leaf base is a stick like structure but in monocotyledons the case is different the leaf base extends like a sheath this extends like a sheath and covers the stem partially or wholly in leguminous plants the leaf base become swollen and is called pulvinous this pulvinous enables the plants to adjust its leaf orientation in response to light and other stimuli it acts as a flexible joint we have already discussed the fact that the leaf blade or lamina contains numerous veins and veinlets the arrangement of these veins and veinlets in the lamina are known as venation when the veins run parallel to each other here you can see these veins are parallel when the veins run parallel to each other that arrangement is called parallel venation and when they form a network of venation that is called reticulate venation dicotyledons show reticulate venation and monocotyledons show parallel venation when there is only a single blade present on the petiole this is the petiole when there is a single blade is present that is known as simple leaf that means incision on the lamina will not touch the midrib these incisions it will not touch the midrib simple leaves may be variously lobed along their margins when the blade of the leaf has two or more subunits then the leaf is called a compound leaf the incisions made on the lamina reach up to the midrib breaking it into many small subunits these subunits are called the leaflets compound leaf can be of two types they are pinnately compound leaf and palmately compound leaf many leaflets are present in a common axis that is pinnately compound leaf a row of leaflets form on either side of an extension of the petiole called the rachis on either side of the rachis a row of leaflets are formed this is pinnately compound leaf and we can observe pinnately compound leaf in neem palmately compound leaf the leaflets are attached at a common point here we can see these are the leaflets 1 2 3 4 5 6 these leaflets are attached to a common point and the leaflets radiate from a single point at the distal end of the petiole for example cotton leaves 
the pattern with which the leaves are arranged on a stem or a branch is known as phyllotaxy the arrangement of leaves or phyllotaxy can be of three types alternate phyllotaxy opposite phyllotaxy or world phyllotaxy in alternate phyllotaxy a single leaf arises at each node and they are arranged on the stem in an alternate manner on both sides this is one leaf there is no other leaf on the opposite side but here there is another leaf here another one so this is in an alternate pattern that is the alternate phyllotaxy for example china rose mustard and sunflower in opposite phyllotaxy one leaf arises from each knot and the leaves arranges opposite to one another on both side of the stem example olive leaves world phyllotaxy arrangements of leaves in a circular pattern around the stem more than two leaves arises at each knot for example astonia and world mist a flower a flower is a modified part of the shoot we know that the apical meristem that is at the tip of the stem that we can see some meristematic cells they are known as the apical meristematic cells and these apical meristematic cells are responsible for the growth of the stem we have already discussed that leaves can also grow from these apical meristematic cells this is the apical meristematic cells from here leaves also can grow a portion of this shoot apical meristem differentiates to form the floral meristem which give rise to the flower at the time of this change that the apical meristem differentiate to form the floral meristem there is a shift from vegetative growth to reproductive growth and at the same time hormonal changes also happen for example there will be less production of auxin to reduce the stem elongation and there will be increased production of cytokines the inner nodes that means the space between the two nodes will not elongate any further and the axis get condensed this will allow the plant to focus its energy on the production of flowers we commonly see single flowers but there are also clusters of flowers are in there the arrangement of these clusters of flowers on the stem or floral axis is called inflorescence the arrangement of clusters of flowers on the stem or the floral axis is the inflorescence there are mainly two types of inflorescence racemous inflorescence and cymose inflorescence in racemous inflorescence the floral axis continues to grow and will never change into a flower this is the floral axis this continues to grow that will not change into a flower flowers are born laterally to that axis in acropetal succession acropetal succession means the young flower will be on the top and the older one at the bottom the floral axis continues to grow and flowers are born laterally to the floral axis this will continue to grow this floral axis will continue to grow cymose inflorescence here the flower axis won't grow further but rather terminates into a flower here this the end portion is a flower this axis won't grow further it terminates into a flower that is a cymose inflorescence here the flowers are arranged in basi petal order meaning the young flowers arise at the bottom and older flowers can be seen at the top in racemous inflorescence the flowers are arranged in acropetal succession and in cymose inflorescence the flowers are arranged in basi petal succession basi petal means young flowers arise at the bottom older ones can be seen at the top Let's learn more about flowers. We know that the reproductive part of a plant is flower. The bottom part of the flower is called the stalk or pedicel. 
on the pedicel we can observe various type of structures known as calyx corolla andrisium gynecium etc we will learn in detail about these parts later in this video flowers are the reproductive part of a plant calyx and corolla are accessory organs andrisium is the male reproductive organ and gynecium is the female reproductive organ in some flowers like lily the calyx and corolla are joined together and are known as perianth when a flower bears both andrisium and gynecium it is known as bisexual flower and if a flower has either andrisium or gynecium it is known as a unisexual flower in the animal kingdom we learned about symmetry like radial and bilateral symmetry right here flowers also have symmetry Radially symmetrical flowers are called actinomorphic that means a flower can be divided into equal halves by any plane that passes through its center example mustard datura and chili bilaterally symmetrical flowers are known as zygomorphic these flowers can be divided into two equal halves by only one plane that passes through its center example pea gulmohar and bean Some flowers like canna have no symmetry at all they cannot be divided into equal halves by any plane passing through its center hence we can say that they are asymmetrical based on the number of petals present flowers can be divided into three trimerous tetramerous and pentamerous here in trimerous a flower has three petals for example iris In tetramerous a flower has four petals for example nostratums in pentamerous flowers five petals are there example buttercups bracteate flower some flowers has modified leaves that are present at the base of the pedicel they are often larger and colorful than the actual petals and are known as bracts The flowers that have bracts are known as bracteate flowers for example bougain villa china rose and tulip these bracts are protective in function they protect the delicate flower parts from environmental stress and the flowers without bracts are known as e bracteate flowers for example mustard parts of a flower as we have previously discussed A flower consists of four main parts also known as floral whorls. A calyx is the outermost whorl of the flower. A bud is protected with green leaf like structures. They are known as sepals and all these sepals together are known as calyx. When the sepals are joined together it is called gamosepalous and when the sepals are free we can say it is polysepalous number of sepals can vary from 3 to 5 the edge can be smooth toothed or lobed so all the sepals together known as the calyx corolla we know that the colorful part of the flowers are the petals these are the sepals and these colorful parts they are the petals the collective term of the petals is corolla as they are brightly colored their main function is in pollination by attracting insects when the petals are united we can call it gamopetalous and when the petals are free we can call it polypetalous when the sepals are joined we call it gamosepalous when petals are joined we call it gamopetalous when sepals are free we call it polysepalous when petals are free we call it polypetalous the shape and color of corolla can vary in different plants in some cases the corolla may be tubular and bell shaped andrisium andrisium is the male reproductive organ This andrisium consists of stamens. Each stamen has a stalk or a filament and an anther. This stamen has two parts, filament and anther. Each lobe has two 
chambers these lobes have two chambers they are known as the pollen sacs each lobe of anther has two chambers and they are called pollen sacs a stamen that cannot produce pollen is called staminode that is a sterile stamen it cannot participate in fertilization as it is sterile but it has other functions like it attracts the pollinators guide the pollinators towards the functional parts and provides support when the stamens are attached to the petals they are known as epipetals we can observe this in brinjal this is the brinjal flower and these are the stamens and these stamens are attached to the petals hence the name epipetalus in lily we can see the stamens are attached to the perianth do you remember the term perianth when calyx and corolla are united we can call it a perianth hence the stamens are attached to the perianth then we can call it epiphyllus when stamens are free we call it polyanthus here this is sunflower and these are the stamens these stamens are free inside the flower hence we can call it polyanthus sometimes the stamens are joined as a bundle if they are united as a single bundle then it is called monoadelphus like in china rose that is the hibiscus here you can see this is a single bundle these stamens hence it is known as monoadelphus there are diadelphus flowers the stamens are united in two bundles they are arranged often with different length for example is p here we can see this is a single bundle of stamens and this can be another bundle so the length also varies here two bundles of stamens if there are more than two bundles then we can call it polyadelphus example rose gynoecium is the female reproductive part gynoecium is made up of one or more carpels this is one carpel each carpel consists of stigma this is stigma style and an ovary ovary is situated at the base and it is the enlarged part from the ovary a tube arises that is called the style this green part that is the style and it ends in a structure at its tip called the stigma this is the receptive area of pollen stigma is the receptive area of pollen the style guides the pollen tube from the stigma to the ovary allowing fertilization to occur each ovary has one or more ovules you can see ovules inside and they are attached to a cushion like placenta the ovules contain the egg and it provides the location for fertilization Placenta provides the surface for ovules to grow. It provides nutrients and resources for the developing ovules. We learned that the gynoecium contains one or more carpels. When more than one carpels is present, they may be free from one another and are called apocarpus. For example, lotus. You can see here multiple carpels. They are known as apocarpus. when the carpels are fused like in mustard and tomato it is called syncarpus after fertilization we know that the ovules develop into seeds and ovary into fruits aestivation the arrangement of sepals and petals in a flower bud before it blooms is called aestivation it describes how petals and sepals are positioned relative to each other there are many types of aestivation first one is valvate example calotropis when the sepals and petals meet at the edge without overlapping with each other then the arrangement is called valvate aestivation here in this bud this is one petal 
this is another this is another and this is another one these petals meet at the edge without overlapping to each other hence we can say that it is the valvate estivation next is the twisted estivation example cotton and china rose when the edge of the sepals and petals overlap with each other that arrangement is called twisted here you can see these petals they overlap with one another hence we can say that it is the twisted estivation next is the imbricate estivation example cassia gulmohar when the petals and sepals are irregularly overlapped here you can see they are irregularly overlapped without a particular direction that is called imbricate estivation next is the vexillary estivation example bean flower or pea flower here usually five petals can be seen the standard petal or the larger one is arranged on the outer side inside there will be two lateral petals which are known as the wings inside that will be the smallest anterior petals or keel present this arrangement is also known as papilionaceous arrangement placentation the arrangement of ovules in the ovary is called placentation they are arranged on the placenta that is why the name there are different types of placentation marginal placentation here the ovules are attached to the ovary wall along the margin or edge the placenta is the ridge or a line along the margin of the ovary and ovules are arranged in two rows along the placenta for example p next is axial placentation the ovules are arranged to the central axis of the ovary it is found in plants with multilocular ovary that is ovary has more than two chambers here we can see many chambers then parietal placentation ovules are born on the inner walls of the ovary here the ovary is a single chamber but due to the formation of incomplete partitions called septa we can feel it as it is many chambered but it is actually a single chamber which are divided with an incomplete septa for example melon next is free central placentation here the ovules are freely arranged on the central axis they are freely arranged on the central axis without the presence of septa example dianthus and bell pepper the last type of placentation is basal placentation placenta develops at the base of the ovary and a single ovule is attached to it inside this a single ovule is there for example sunflower and marigold here we saw five types of placentation marginal axil parietal free central and basal placentation ovary matured to form the fruit whereas ovules developed into seeds there is a covering on the seed called the seed coat inside it is the embryo the embryo is made up of a radical an embryonic axis and one or two cotyledons we already saw in beginning of this video that dicotyledons the radical extends into the soil and forms the primary root Now let's learn the structure of dicotyledon seed. The outermost covering of the seed is known as the seed coat. Seed coat has two layers. The outer layer is known as the testa and the inner layer is known as the tegmen. Both testa and tegmen give protection to the embryo, regulate water intake. and it can impose dormancy on the seed meaning it can inhibit germination until the conditions are favorable there is a scar on the seed coat through which developing seeds are attached to the fruits this scar is known as the hilum and above the hilum 
there is a small pore this is a small pore here and this is known as micropipe its main function is to serve the entry point for pollen tubes during fertilization within the seed coat embryo is there consists of an embryonic axis and one or two cotyledons these are the cotyledons these cotyledons are fleshy and they are food reserve for the developing embryo at the two ends of the embryonic axis is the radical which give rise to the root system and the plumule which give rise to the shoot system in some plants like castor double fertilization takes place means two male nuclei enter the ovule one fuses with the egg to form the zygote and the other fuses with the nuclei situated in the pole to form endosperm this endosperm is a food storing tissue the seeds that have endosperm are called endosperm seeds and those do not have that in like pea and bean they are called non endospermous seeds structure of monocotyledon seeds generally monocotyledon seeds have endosperm however orchids are non endospermous seeds which comes under monocotyledons in the seeds of cereals the seed coat is membranous meaning it is thin flexible and translucent resembling a membrane it is generally fused with the fruit wall and the endosperm is bulky and stores food this is because they have only one cotyledon that acts as a food reserve they need more for the developing embryo that is why the endosperm is bulky in monocotyledons than in dicotyledons the outer covering of the endosperm separates the embryo by a proteinaceous layer this layer is known as aleurone layer it helps in protein storage and enzyme production the embryo is small and situated in a groove at one end of the endosperm embryo has one large shield shaped the scutellum this is the scutellum and an embryonic axis with radical and plumule this is radical and this side is the plumule this is the plumule and plumule is enclosed in a sheath called coleoptile and radical is enclosed in a sheath called coleorissa plumule is enclosed in coleoptile and radical is enclosed in coleorissa that's it about the chapter morphology of flowering plants if you like this video please share it with your friends if you have any queries put it in the comment